That's right. It's time for Mark Meets, in which I speak to the biggest names in the world of politics, showbiz, sport, business and beyond. Tonight, one of the most experienced and high profile politicians in the country, Sir John Redwood, who entered the House of Commons in 1987, a golden era of British politics. And of course, at the tail end of Margaret Thatcher's reign in power. He served as Secretary of State for Wales in John Major's government and sat in the shadow cabinet under both William Hague and Michael Howard. He's even had a couple of runs, a couple of runs at becoming party leader. John has for decades carved out a reputation as a politician committed to economic liberalism, fiscal discipline, and he has perhaps most notably been a consistent long-term Eurosceptic. As one of the founding fathers of Brexit, he has achieved his goal with our departure. But what next for Britain? as we move on from the pandemic and deal with significant economic challenges. And what next for Sir John himself? Sir John Redwood, the Conservative MP for Wokingham in Berkshire, joins me now. Good evening, Sir John. Good evening, Mark. Wonderful to have you on the programme. What made you enter politics, Sir John? You could have made a fortune in industry. Well, as a young man in, in Britain, the, the country was ailing, the economy was under the cosh of too much nationalisation, too much government interference, very high taxes. And people were saying to me, why don't you go to America? They were kind enough to say, right, young man like you, as they thought I then was, um, could indeed uh, flourish in America. And I said, no, this is my country. I wish to stay and battle away to make it better. Uh, and so I began my tasks uh, as a young man by saying that the state was involved too much, uh, that it was throttling us, it was costing us too much money, it was performing very badly. And I took the idea of privatisation to Margaret Thatcher, uh, and she eventually came round to it, and then she invited me uh, to be her advisor on it all in Downing Street uh, in the early 80s, which I then went to do. And so my political career began with an unusual success because politics is quite difficult. Um, I don't think I realised quite how difficult it was because I, I, there I was as Prime Minister's advisor and she then accepted the idea that we needed a very big privatisation programme because we needed to catch up with the United States of America. Our telecoms industry was about 10 years behind them and totally out of date because it had been messed up by monopoly provision and inadequate public funding of new investment. Our energy industries were a mess, uh, not providing all that we wanted and not competitive and certainly not green enough. Uh, and privatisation started to transform that. So it was a very exciting time. What was most special about Thatcher? Was it policy or personality? Well, it was the two together. I mean, it, she was the best boss I've ever worked for. Um, she liked a good argument. Uh, she would sometimes take a long time to make up her mind because I think she knew that once she had made up her mind and went public, she wasn't going to change it. And so she wanted to test out uh, any idea that you took to her quite rightly. It could, could be quite a long period when she was testing it out with other people. But then when she did decide to go for it, there was that phenomenal energy, determination, discipline, ability to get the message across in, in language that uh, persuaded enough people, which was a, a pleasure to work with. So, John, what was it in your upbringing and early life experience that made you a conservative? I'm not sure what it was. Uh, it's just the were way you, I looked at the world stories? as were, were I went about my education. Were, were, were your parents um, may also have been I had one or two teachers who were very left wing okay. um, and I didn't agree with them. I thought they looked at the world in a strange way. And the world I was born into, um, post-war, uh, was was a Cold War world. And so I read and studied what was happening in the Soviet Union in China. And I thought it was dreadful. And I could see we were engaged in a great struggle to show that our system was better and to avoid our system uh, being damaged by them. Uh, the very beginning of the, the period when I was very young, there was the big standoff between Soviet Union and America uh, over the missiles going into Cuba. Uh, which reminded us just how dangerous the Cold War could be. And the more I looked at it, the more I said, I know which side I'm on. I'm on the side of freedom. I'm on the side of free enterprise. I'm on the side of democracy. I'm on the side of liberty. Uh, it makes people more prosperous. It's better for us. You can have your own views. You can try and settle your disagreements by arguments and votes rather than by something more brutal. 
Uh, so it was a no-brainer to me which side I was on. So then I thought, well, I better enter into this uh, wholeheartedly in a good spirit. And that was why I then started writing and generating ideas that would advance the causes of free enterprise, democracy and freedom. Uh, you stood against John Major in the party leadership election in 1995. You famously won the support of the Sun newspaper, which ran the brilliant headline Redwood versus Deadwood, referring to Major. Are you the prime minister that got away? Well, I was the prime minister they didn't want, wasn't I? <laughs> uh, I had uh, two goes at being leader of the Conservative Party once when we were still in office, uh, but not really in power. Uh, and then once after we'd lost the election, my slogan in that first uh, leadership election was no change, no chance. And unfortunately, it was extremely accurate. It turned out we had no chance with no change because we went down to biggest ever defeat uh, that we've witnessed as Conservatives in the post-war period. Uh, that was very predictable. Not enough of my colleagues believe me when I made that prediction. And so they carried on to defeat. Uh, Sir John, approximately two years ago, I had the privilege of you as a guest on my old radio show. And this was early in the pandemic and people were worried about the economy. And you said to me, Mark, the policy should be go for growth. Um, you have been judged to have been very right about that. Uh, that's not the policy of the current government, even though it is a conservative government. I'm sure you were supportive of Liz, Tr Liz Truss's plans. Uh, that uh, mini budget, poorly executed, but the right policy. So very briefly, if you can, um, what would your proposed plan be for the economy, for the migrant crisis? And what is your appraisal of Rishi Sunak? Well, I think Rishi Sunak does have to make quite a lot of changes. We've only got two years and we need to offer something better. And yes, I think the, the rhetoric of, of Liz Truss was exactly right. Uh, we needed to go for growth. We needed lower taxes. Uh, she didn't accept my advice on the overall package. Uh, I didn't have quite such a generous tax cutting package as she did. I didn't think we could necessarily afford uh, the immediate income tax cut. Uh, I thought the uh, energy package overall was a bit too generous. And I did have some public expenditure reductions to help balance it. And I wanted them to present the spending alongside the taxes with decent forecasts of borrowing. I think that would have been more rounded. I think they were going to get on to that, but they weren't allowed time by the speed with which the political attacks reined in on them. I think it's a great tragedy for our country, uh, as well as for my party, because I think the, the general direction was the correct one. So I'm now urging uh, Mr. Sunak and Mr. Hunt to recognise that you do need growth from here, that the economy is slowing too sharply, that the Bank of England has lurched from a uh, irresponsibly inflationary policy in 2021 to a very tough monetary policy now, which will slow the economy a lot. And so I think the government does need to look to do more uh, to offset some of that and promote growth with selective tax cuts, with um, better controls over public spending, uh, and with a overall affordable package of investment and promotion of more activity at home. I've always said that now we're out of the EU, we need to take advantage but the freedoms it brings. It wasn't an abstract or an ideological issue for me. It was that there were things I want to do for our country, which we couldn't do all the time we were in the EU. And we're being very slow about taking up the advantages that it can bring us. We should be growing more of our own food. We should be rebuilding our fishing industry. We should be developing our ports without the ports directive and with rather more free port encouragement. We, we should be uh, creating our own energy markets again because we became too import dependent because we were going into a common energy policy, which, like all their common policies, meant that we imported too much. Uh, I want to start changing all that, and that would help offset some of the very deflationary forces that we're seeing from Bank of England policy uh, and obviously from the energy price rises created uh, in briefly, part by uh, the Ukraine briefly. war. Briefly, Sir John, uh, the migrant crisis, how would you tackle it? Because it's not sustainable, is it? A thousand people a day at times. No, I mean, take back control of our borders was very crucial to, to winning Brexit. And it was absolutely central to the manifesto that helped us win the election in 2019. And there are two elements to that. I mean, first of all, that they do need, I think, to change the law and to accelerate the processing uh, of applications uh, in order to reduce the numbers coming 
um, illegally and the small boat business. They need to change their policy towards that. But more generally, uh, because they are only a fraction of the overall numbers coming in, they need to reduce legal migration for the low paid jobs at, at the bottom end of the economic market. Uh, we've got hundreds of thousands of people at home where we could mentor them, help them, assist them uh, into jobs and then promote better jobs within that. We need also more automation and investment in our country so that the jobs are more fulfilling and, and better paid. We need to get on with that task. That, I thought, was what levelling up was all about. I thought that was what we were trying to do by, by leaving the European Union. And so I'm really impatient. I'm really cross that we're not getting on with it more quickly. Just a couple of seconds left, Sir John. Uh, you've had a great career. You're a knight of the realm. You're admired by many, a good chunk of my viewers, I would say. The emails are coming in thick and fast. Uh, John Redwood for Prime Minister, please, please, please. Um, what is your next ambition? <laughs> what would you like to do next? Well, I just want to help our country make a great success of Brexit and be more prosperous. I want to see us through this difficult period. Uh, I think the big mistakes by the Bank of England, now being reinforced in part by the Treasury, need to be reversed because I think we are a great country with a great future. Uh, but that requires these changes in policy towards migration, towards the state of the economy, towards taxation. Uh, we need to free, liberate, support, promote. We don't want a, a big cold shower to be told that we can't do anything and the taxes have got to go up.